Uh, kia ora koutou, ko Nari Bayers tēnei ki te taho tōku māma, huri tēnei nō te arua me Ngāpuhi, ki te taho tōku pāpa, huri tēnei nō Klawhi Hangul nō Waira, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, so this morning I'm one of three panellists uh, for this webinar and joining me is Vais Albi Lauren, and who is the General Manager of the National City Prevention Coordination Service and Professor David Tipani Leach who works at EIT in the Hawke's Bay and uh, who is our Sudi prevention guru. So, kia ora, kia ora kōrua. Uh, we would like to take this opportunity to thank Safe Kids for giving us the opportunity just to uh, discuss, promote and whakamana wahakura and everything that this entails. Uh, nā mihi kia koutou e Safe Kids. Uh, so I thought for all we would provide, I would provide a context for this webinar and by doing that I'd explain and break down the title of our um, webinar which is Hene Te Iwa Iwa Harm Reduction Through Wahakura. So Hine Te Iwa Iwa is most commonly referred to as the guardian of childbirth, of kapahaka, of domesticity and the art of weaving. So through our tribal narratives, this atua or this name embodies knowledge and belief systems that are translated by whānau, hapu and iwi and sometimes in very unique and subtle ways. Today we give you a small insight of this atua through the kōrero of harm reduction through wahakura. So harm reduction, reducing harm through the active personification and representation of atua. Harm reduction through prevention, tools, engagement, collaboration, partnerships, media, and communications. Harm reduction through wahakura. Wahakura are the only sleeping space made of natural resources crafted using Māori ancestral weaving methods. Wahakura is the only tangible Māori harm reduction tool. Within this title is a multitude of kōrero narratives and some of which I will hopefully tease out of David and Faye in this session. But one thing we would like you to take away from this kōrero is safety is implicit to Māori demonstrated in tikanga and kawa. We have a whole series of mātauranga about safety. Tapu and noa are examples of how Māori determine safety and being unsafe. Wahakura is one way of returning and revitalising traditional practices and messages that were disrupted and dismantled through the process of colonisation. We see other practices being revitalised alongside wahakura, such things as the celebration of matariki, using the season to harvest and maintain our paharakeke, and personally even the practice of mokokoai, embracing my identity as a Māori woman, providing my mokopuna with identity markers with art and with creativity. So as we go into this, uh, next three sections of this webinar, uh, we've broken it down into um, explaining te whare pōra, pōra in the context of wahakura and safety. Uh, the second session is safe sleep messaging for whānau. And lastly, we'll have a Q&A session at the end um, we are Faye and, and David. You can pose questions on the chat and uh, we'll, we'll pose these to Faye and David at the end of the session. For this, can you please get the questions in sooner rather than later, uh, just so that uh, we, can, we can find them in the chat and I can be, I can be given them for, for the session. So, uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Te whare pōra in the context of wahakura and safety. So, David, kia ora. Can you quickly introduce yourself and provide a kōrero of te whare pōra in the context of wahakura and safety? Na kia ora tātou e, e tiro mai nei ki tēnei whakātūranga e whakarongo mai nei. Um, tēnā kōtou huri noa ki tēnā tātou. David Tibane Leach is my name. I, I work at EIT. I come from the Hawke's Bay, from a little town called Pōrangaho, and I was um, kind of involved in the invention, if you like, of the wahakura. So the wahakura was, um, came about um, in sort of 2005 after we had observed a, a sort of five-year flattening of the, um, or no more reductions in Māori SIDS. So I was in general practice up on the coast, and every year we would look in, and we'd look at the numbers, and we had five years' worth of no change in numbers after a sort of six year period of, of year by year reduction 
in what at the time was called SIDS deaths. Um, by now they have been called SUDI deaths because we started to include um, accidental suffocation and other kind of unknown, unable to be defined deaths. But nevertheless, that all flattened out and we thought, what on earth are we going to do next? Um, it's all about smoking. Um, uh, sorry, it's all about bed sharing where there was smoking and pregnancy and the mix of those two things and how those things um, create um, in dangerous conditions, create a baby who's not up to coping with dangerous um, conditions or risky conditions. And so we figured that it was too hard to work with um, smoking and pregnancy, especially when you're sitting on the coast uh, in general full-time general practice. So we tried to, um, and that's so medical, you know, it's so sort of doctory stuff and and, and nursey stuff. And so what we needed was a community-based program. So we decided to work with um, with bed sharing that was supposed to be unsafe. Uh, of course, we all know that bed sharing is a good thing to do around the world. It's what we've done for centuries and centuries. And in fact, we didn't start, we didn't stop bed sharing until the Industrial Revolution came along and, and mums had to work 14-hour shifts in great big dirty factories. And so they had to put their babies a, out of their beds, and B, in other rooms. So, you know, bed sharing, we need to remember, is a normal practice. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out how can we make bed sharing safe? Because if you get rid of one half of the bed sharing, whether it's smoking and pregnancy risk factor, then theoretically you can get rid of a huge amount of that risk. Um, so we invented the wahakura. I mean, it's not complicated. It is a bassinet type arrangement woven out of flax that will enable uh, mums and dads and grandparents and whoever else to bed chair to sleep alongside the baby. So baby has got this protected space with a wall that's kind of prickly and noticeable and kind of hard um, and it's it creates the safe, safe space for baby. So it was pretty simple stuff. The thinking it through, the inventing of it, the making of it, the working with weavers, um, the getting it out um, through um, the Māori midwifery networks up there, it was all good stuff and it was all about safety that was totally and absolutely consistent with A, normal behaviour, because that's what Māori mums were doing, bed sharing, and B, tikanga. In other words, it was something that was attractive um, to Māori um, and, and was something that we were used to and something that we felt, hey, it's flax, flax is a medicine, Here's, this is great, let's do it. And that's how Māori mums greeted it. It was greeted fabulously. Um, and there were lots of problems along the way, but that was how it started. And that's all about safety. Mm, kia ora. And just with Te Whare Pōra, I'm just trying to... Um, get you to explain the space of Te Whare Pōra? So the Te Whare Pōra, Te Whare Pōra is a clinic, if you like, a, a clinic, well, it's a space, it's not a clinic, but it sort of is. So if you extend the argument that, um, okay, if people are going to weave and people are going to create the wahakura, um, is this not an opportunity to do more than just... Um, you know, at the moment, what happens in the safe sleep program is that we give a safe sleep device to mums who are at risk or babies who are at risk, right? We provide a safe sleep device. So if we've got a Māori run institution that is not a clinic and that's not fronted by doctors and nurses, but by weavers, then isn't that a great place for pregnant whānau to meet? So you meet you weave, and yes, the idea is that you can weave a wahakura, that's the big aim at the end, but you know, people go there, they don't know how to weave. So they start weaving little wee headers to tie off the um, umbilical cord, and then they weaving a little um, ipu um, pito, a little wee tiny container for the, the pito when it falls off, and then a bigger container for the um, placenta when it's um, there, and then finally they get to um, weave a wahakura. But of course, during this period of time, what are you doing? Well, you're hanging out with a whole lot of other Māori women, and in particular, you're hanging out with a tohunga. You're hanging out with a Māori woman or two or three 
who are expert weavers, who hold knowledge, who have done all this before, who know how to bring up kids, who are connected in the community. Um, so it's a way of connecting people up, teaching them Māori stuff. Um, and we all know, you know, we all kind of accept that many of us, particularly those of us in hard up situations, we don't know much Māori stuff these days. Um, and we all hunger for it. And so what you see is you see um, younger women and, and some not so young women who just grow and flower in the whare pōra as they learn to weave. Now, of course, there's another secret agenda in the whare pōra, or it's not quite so secret, but you know, if you're gaining confidence, then it's, you're much more, it's much easier for you to be able to engage with health professionals. It's easier for you to be able to think through, oh, can I um, stop smoking perhaps? And yes, there is a program there that's associated with the whare pōra. And gosh, you know, I'm going to get into contact with people um, to, to do antenatal classes and to do um, hapu, uh, hapu wānanga, so do Māori antenatal classes. And, you know, once baby's born, I've got the connections. I know how to breastfeed. And so suddenly you've got all the sudi risk factors covered. You've got bed sharing covered. You've got smoking in pregnancy covered. You've got the breastfeeding covered, um, you know, and you, you're, you're connected. Um, and, and, and these, not the, I was going to say these women, but these families grow, these whānau grow. Um, and it's hinete iwa iwa. So hinete iwa iwa, the atua, um, as Nari said, the atua of weaving, yes, but of pregnancy, of childbirth, and of raising kids. I mean, where else would you go? And Whareapora was her university. It was her learning space. It was where everybody went to learn about that sort of stuff. So yeah, Whareapora, we have one here in, um, in Flaxmere. It's the first. We're uh, working on it, refining it, getting the services up and running well. Um, women are loving it. We're planting flax all over the place because we recognize that, you know, we're short of flax. So actually this weekend, I'm going out to start a new pa harakeke at Pōrangaho. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we're all over it. Um, and it's really exciting and other people are wanting one of these sort of places in their rohe. But so there's the whare pōra, the te whare pōra o hene te iwa iwa. Koina. Kia ora, kia ora. So Faye, uh, welcome. Can you just quickly introduce yourself? And I thought we can ask you why wahakura as opposed to other devices? Okay, oh, tēnā tātou, tēnā koutou, um, ko whae so we lō tōku ingoa. Um, I don't quite come from such a small place as Pōrangahau, but um, my iwi affiliations are Ngāti Parau and Ngāti Raukaua Kids Tonga, and my principal marae is um, very close to Hokio Beach in the Hura Whanua, um, but I do live in Palmerston North, and um, Ngāti's asked me to talk a little bit about why, why wahakura, I think um, from my perspective, and, and um, David's already spoken a, a lot about the connection for Māori women, and actually Māori men also weave, so it's, it's not limited, it's actually about, about whānau. Um, so for me, it's about oranga whenua. So wahakura come from Papatua Nuku, so we're talking about hine te iwa iwa, but our, if we consider our earth mother, um, the ability to take care of her and what she provides for us. So I see wahakura as part of the rongoa of taking care of, of our tamariki. Um, the pā itself is, a, is an embodiment of whānau and when you go and learn how to weave, you actually first have to learn how to, how to cut the flax. And that means understanding that there's a baby in the middle, the reto, and then the parents and then the grandparents. And you can't afford to get the cut wrong, you can't afford to take the wrong one, otherwise you can destroy that whānau. Um, so that, that's the starting point. And then um, all the, the parts of a, uh, a whenu, of a uh, um, leaf of uh, harakeke, has healing properties, has rongoa properties. So together, that, that's all important as well. And if you've ever had the opportunity to be around weavers and smell harakeke, that's the first thing that I always think comes to mind for me, is that wonderful smell, that wonderful... Um, place that, you were, you were places you were in when you smell a harakeke. 
Um, David's already spoken about how it brings us together, it brings whānau together, it brings knowledgeable people. He talks about tūhunga, um, they come together and they share their knowledge and as you weave, whether it's just making a puti puti or a um, or something small, a kono, whatever you decide to make, right through to the to the wahakura. So we principally believe that wahakura provide a place and a space for Māori that, as David talks about, identifies ourselves. Um, we know it, it gives us a lot of pleasure, a lot of happiness, and it protects our tamarahi. It gives them a place to be. Um, so for me, that's why wahakura. I personally would love to think that everybody in Aotearoa has the opportunity to choose to have a wahakura. At the moment, we don't have enough, so we, we tend to want them to be for Māori in the first instance. But long term, I'd like to think that if you want a wahakura, whomever you are, wherever you live in Aotearoa, you can go to a wharekura and make one of your own, or you can sit beside someone and learn and receive one for your pēpi. So David, um, I think you covered some of this off in your previous kōrero, but I thought I'd um, ask you about the research pertaining to wahakura. Uh, is there research? Um, is it more about safe sleep and, and just your thoughts on wahakura as a harm reduction tool, maybe in a broader context? Can I say, first of all, just to, thinking about the smell of the wahakura. In, in the research that we did, that was one of the things that mums talked about. Yeah. They talked about the smell of the flax and how it made them feel good and how they believed that actually that smell was good for the baby to be growing up with and was healthy for the baby to be growing up with. And, you know, I mean, who knows? We might find out, uh, you yeah, know, this is a wonderful piece of research if we could do it. We might find out that wahakura babies don't have asthma, for instance. Oh. I mean, wouldn't that be exciting? If we were able to do a child development study of wahakura babies versus babies who, you know, otherwise healthy babies who, who did other things in their babyhood. And we found that uh, wahakura babies didn't have asthma or, or something of that nature. But the smell is really important. And can I comment also on the men? Yes, men weave. And in fact, in our, in our whare porter, the chief, the hunger, the one who coordinates all the work in Hawke's Bay is a man. <laughs> but he's the only one. There's only one or two of them, but 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 there is no doubt about it that Hineta Iwa Iwa is a place that is totally and absolutely under the control of the female element. So yep, he's there, and yep, he's their expert, you know, but by jingoes, the women rule. So it it really is um a, it's a woman's place. And yes, it, we, we talk about the whare pula being a place for pregnant whānau, not for pregnant women, but for pregnant whānau. And yes, we're trying to bring the men in, and they do come, and we're developing programs uh, whereby, you know, men can learn to be men, so to speak. And in some way, sometimes that'll be in the weaving. More often, interestingly, it's in the planting, it's in the picking. So, you know, you get this idea that here she is, and she's sending her man out to get the get the flax and he's bringing it back and he's doing all the you know he's stripping it and doing all that sort of stuff there are roles um and men are, are, are very much a part of that role you know i think i've got off topic there a bit oh, so I, about, the, um, about the research yeah we, we we did a lot of research and we had to do research because there we are back at the um on the coast and, you know, we've invented this thing and we've got it out to all these women um, and then suddenly we've run out, right? Because once upon a time we thought that they would come back. Well, that was a bit silly, wasn't it? You know, this wonderful object, we thought that they would come back when they were finished and we'd give them out to other mothers. Well, of course they didn't come back. They already gave them out to other mothers. They gave them out to their sisters and their cousins and their neighbours. And so we never saw any of these ones that we gave out. We never saw them back again. They disappeared into the community and they started to go round and round and round. So um, in order to start getting volume, if you like, we had to start writing. Um, we had to start getting into people's places and if you like, into their faces with this thing about the wahakura um, and try to um, curry favour in the eyes of the health profession and, and other people 
um, to help us get a plan to roll this thing out. So, of course, you know, 6,000 Māori babies born every year. It's probably 7,000 now. Um, and here we were, we had 100 wahakura in, in the little towns of the East Coast from sort of Gisborne northwards. Um, so, yeah, we had to do a lot of work and we started off just writing, not research, just writing. And so there was information stuff that went out first. And, but then we had to say, well, gosh, you know, we, we're going to have to start proving ourselves and we're going to have to say, is it, is it bed sharing? Um, sorry, is it, yeah, is it bed sharing where there is smoking and pregnancy? Is that really the risk? We theoretically knew that that was the risk, but is it true? And so we went to Auckland. One of our pieces that we did, we went to Auckland um, and we had a, a colleague of ours, um, Professor Ed Mitchell, who had done a big piece of work in National Women's uh, around SIDS risk factors and behaviours. And so we looked at his work to see, well, what's the difference between Māori women and non-Māori women there? And of course, you know, he, he didn't have any, very many Māori women. So we said, Ed, come on, let's go and do this same, exactly the same piece of research in, um, in Manuka. So we went out there to Middlemore Hospital. We did the same piece of work. And of course, what we found is that if you were Māori, you were 21 times more likely to bed share and smoke in pregnancy, 21 times more likely. So you were six times more likely to smoke. Um, you were three or four times more likely to bed share. Interestingly, we did, we did note that 20% um, of non-Maori women um, bed share all the time. So again, that was part of the, the, the proof of the pudding, you know, that bed sharing is normal. There's a whole bunch of, of Pākehā women out there who bed share. That's what people do. Yep. But nevertheless, this business about um, smoke, uh, smoking and pregnancy and then going on to bed share, 21 times more likely uh, in the Māori community. And so, hello, we'd come up with this bit of evidence that said, yes, it was true what we were talking about. The next bit of work we did was a piece around, well, okay, you know, somebody, for instance, someone in the, in the Ministry of Health who might have the money to fund the program might say to us, and indeed they did, but they might say to us, well, you know, this is some crazy Maori doctor on the coast came up with this idea, but how do we know that Maori women like it? So we went out there and we did some work around that. And we did, we did a qualitative project with Wahakura using mums, um, which was really about, was this appropriate? What were its drawbacks? What were, what were the great things that you found about it? Did you use it consistently? Those sorts of things. And of course, that was the study that we found that people talked about the smell um, and their perception of the health giving um, qualities of the flax and the wahakura, uh, their perceptions around safety, um, their sleeping more easily at night because there was a wahakura there. Um, knowing that they would have bed sheared anyway, that most of these women would not have gone and put their baby in a bassinet. Um, so we, we came up with this idea that, um, uh, sorry, one more important thing, is that women told us that they felt um, that the wahakura brought them close to something that they called spiritually Māori, that it it, 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 there was an element of, you know, gosh, this is me suddenly touching my Māori culture. This is, my Māori culture has become more important than a haka on a TV or in a football game. It's something that's important for me and my baby and my husband, and we're all happy here. And look at this fabulous baby lying down here. Isn't he safe? Isn't she doing well? Aren't they growing up? We followed some of these um, babies through. Uh, these babies almost literally never left their wahakura. They would sleep oh. at them, and then, you know, um, dad would go to work, mum would go to work, um, be home with auntie, right, or, or grandma. Um, and baby would sit in them, and then baby would play in them, um, baby would then sleep in them. And, you know, the wahakura became their whole world. And as these young ones grew up and they started to walk and they outgrew the wahakura, they would then put their toys in it. 
and it would become their playground. And they, you would see these kids walking around dragging their wahakura behind them. So it was kind of like that idea of the safety blanket, the, the, your favorite blanket that you always um, took places. So, you know, we had those sorts of things. We then had to, then the, the question was asked, and this was asked by the ministry, and some kind of important um, um, pediatric professors, he said, well, you know, it sounds good, David, it sounds good, but how can we be sure that you're not introducing something that's unsafe into this child's sleeping environment? We don't actually know this. And so, I mean, you know, in my head, I thought, you've got to be kidding. How can you be asking me that? But then I just had to remember that I've got a medical degree and I understood what he was asking and, you know, we needed to demonstrate safety. And so I challenged um, um, Barry Taylor, Professor Taylor, and said, well, okay, let's do this. Let's get on board. So he jumped on board. Um, um, Sally Baddock from Wellington jumped on board. Uh, and we did what was called the KISS study, the Kahunganu Infant Safe Sleep Study. And that was a study whereby we took 100 mums in wah with wahakura, 100 mums with um, bassinets, randomly assigned, so it was a random control trial. And the importance about a random control trial is it's kind of really up there in terms of the robustness of the evidence and your findings. Um, and what we were doing is we were looking for differences between these two things. We were looking at differences in um, behaviors, in sleep position, in length of sleep. Uh, we did overnight studies in temperature control, in oxygen levels in the blood. Uh, we did everything that you could do. Think of these four kids that were strapped up. The mothers were very patient um, and, you know, they were wonderful. They, they were interested in taking part in the study. And we strapped things onto the kids' legs and we had you know, thermometers all over the place. And, um, but we couldn't find any difference. So we were able to demonstrate that there was no difference at all in anything between a wahakura and the classic bassinet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the conclusion that you make is that you're not introducing anything unsafe to the sleeping environment um, and you know so yes they were a safe item so those were the big pieces of research that we actually did um, we did a lot more writing but they're all around those sorts of questions we did a retrospective case study in Auckland just to answer the question do babies really die in shared beds um, and the answer was yes they did um, you know 75 percent of them were dying in shared beds and in, in the particular um, year period that, that we worked in. Uh, but the final piece of work that um, won the Ministry of Health over was a piece of work that we did with um, Professor Mitchell um, and Stephanie Cohen. And it was really just following the numbers of deaths over a five year period from 211, um, which is soon after the Safe Sleep Programme which came around through to 215. And so the Safe Sleep Program was about the distribution of wahakuras and pepe pods. So pepe pods we haven't talked about, but pepe pods are important to the story because when we, when we couldn't produce enough wahakura, what we did was we thought, mm, what else can we do here? We, we can't get enough flax, we can't get enough weavers. So we're gonna invent the pepe pod. And the pepe pod was supposed to be anything that looked a bit like a wahakura and did the job of a wahakura but wasn't made of flax. Um, and anyhow, one of our colleagues, Stephanie, spotted this plastic box in the plastic box shop that was exactly the same size. Actually, it had little wheels on it and had a top and it had handles and it was made for storing your winter woolies in summer and pushing them under the bed. And so, of course, we threw away the wheels because you know, your baby's scooting down the corridor and threw away the lid and the handles and what have you. And there was this plastic box that we put a mattress in uh, and we were able to reproduce. Um, when we invented the safe sleep program um, that was run from a DHB, we started that here in Hawke's Bay. 
um, and we had a big drop in, in SIDS death that year. Now, of course, it was only a one year um, piece of evidence, which in the big picture is not really very good evidence at all. But it was enough to make other people who were struggling, other DHBs who were struggling with um, SUDI as a problem and not really having a good response to it, um, they said, oh, here's something we can do. And so the Safe Sleep Program kind of moved quite quickly around the DHBs. And over that period of time, from 2011 to 2015, there was a 30% drop in infant mortality in this country. And when you went to look at the who was no longer dying or who was surviving better, it was all Māori babies. Um, and so we concluded that the only thing that had happened in that time, like nobody invented a new antibiotic or a new vaccination, nobody stopped dying of, any, of anything else. This was the only thing that happened. And there were Māori babies mostly, and there were babies in the areas that we had um, distributed, heavily distributed um, either pepe pods or wahakura. And so that 30% drop, the ministry said, okay, we believe you, you've cracked it. Uh, and they took the program on, um, and although they, they pissed around a bit, Faye, <laughs> after 18 months, um, they got Harpai involved, and um, this program has gone from strength to strength. Now, can I jump in there? Because I think there's a piece that I'd like to just add that we became involved in um, when we started, which was um, when, you, when we're thinking about safety, and, uh, and I'm not the scientist, and, and David probably should, you know, would know more, but one of the, our requirements was to have uh, wahakura uh, tested for poisons and chemicals that may be in the flats because that became a concern not long after we started this contract. And so we sent uh, three, three or four wahakura from around the country, from around Aotearoa to Christchurch, and they were, the harakeke was cut and minced up and tested. And it proved that the amount of chemicals of various kinds that is in a flax plant is less than what is in our drinking water. And for a baby to be affected, they'd basically have to bite and chew up and lick um, for a very long period of time and digest uh, the juices that they might manage to get out. So scientifically, if that was a concern that you're thinking, oh, well, here's these these flax plants sitting goodness knows where and being harvested, actually, um, from a chemical point of view, they are safer than the water that you drink every day. Mm. Kia ora. And David, I just thought um, that I could sort of eke out of you. Um, I know that with COVID, there's no um, international travel, but our, our weavers, I know a few now, that are actually exporting overseas. And I know that you, you, you're working with some of the Sudi experts overseas, and I just thought you could mention a couple of the countries and why you're doing that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So... Um so we have a, and I think that I saw, I think Janine's watching the program. I saw Janine coming up before. Um, and so we have another colleague in Australia who's big in the, um, the SUDI prevent, SIDS prevention and SUDI prevention world, um, Janine Young, uh, Professor Janine Young. And Janine saw the, um, the, the uh, what I call it, the Safe Sleep Program with wahakulas and with pepe pods. And in, in collaboration with Stephanie, our colleague in Christchurch, um, so the, the fabulous thing that Stephanie added to the program was um, not finding the pepe pod. I guess we were all, somebody would have found something eventually, but what she did was she, um, she industrialized it. She made it so that you could crank these things out. She solved the production problem because there was a, a, these big earthquakes in Christchurch and suddenly there was 1,500 babies in Christchurch who, whose houses had fallen down. They had no place to sleep. And so she looked around and said, you know, David, we need to roll this out in Christchurch. And so she did. A, she did it. And B, she solved the production problem uh, and got companies on board and, and factories on board and, and, and did the thing. Anyhow, um, Janine and, and Stephanie got together and so um, Janine started using um, um, pepe pods up in some of the Aboriginal areas, I think up in Queensland. 
Um, and as well as that, we've got some interest um, from, from England. So it's, again, it's another researcher. Um, his name is Peter, uh, Peter Blair. And, and Pete is, is interested in at-risk communities in England. Um, where and I think mostly the immigrant communities and their poor English communities, because as deaths go down around the world, Sudi deaths remain high in areas of deprivation. And, you know, it's probably no surprise to be thinking, why are they still high in those areas? It's because they smoke, because poor people smoke you know, deprived people sitting at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale in the Western world smoke cigarettes. Wealthy people have stopped smoking. Wealthy people, the only thing that happens with wealthy people is that they own the smoking companies um, and they make money out of it. But wealthy people have stopped smoking, poor people still smoking. Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, um, people in deprived conditions are living in overcrowded um, housing and often bed sharing. So smoking and bed sharing in these communities is carrying on. Um, deprived communities, indigenous communities. Um, and so we've sent some wahakura overseas um, and they're trying to figure out what's a way that they could use this in bed bed sharing device in a way that is culturally applicable to these communities and how could they promote that. You mm. mentioned before about weavers sending um, Wahakura to Australia, hundreds of them. Yeah. Hundreds of them. Māori women in Australia are saying, Wahakura, Wahakura, can we get them over here? Um, and so, yes, people are um, um, sending them across borders, and no, it's, they're not difficult to get in. There's no um, quarantine or, or any of those sorts of things, or you don't have to spray them down, they, 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 they get in. Um, Kia ora. So just so we're moving on, because I've just looked at the time and thought, oh, this is a very interesting discussion. So um, I just thought we'd just quickly touch on safe sleep messaging for Fano. So um, many of our traditional ori ori, waiata, patiri, karakia and haka were composed to provide information about our wellbeing and behaviour. This is something that we as a service and and they, me and Tiana do, is we're very conscious about when developing SUDI prevention and safe sleep messaging for whānau um, that this is considered. For me, my safe sleep practices were determined by my mother, which aren't necessarily what we know is best practice now in today's conditions, especially as she was a, a um, public health nurse. So I just thought, Faye, if I could ask you to have a quick kōrero about um, safe sleep messaging, mā tauranga, intergenerational messaging, if you can. So Nadu's mum was a public health nurse, my mum was actually a Plunkett nurse, and um, so she grew up, she, she became very clinical about her approach to safe sleep through uh, the learnings of, of being a Plunkett nurse. Um, and David's already alluded to the fact that there was a change back in the Industrial Revolution, uh, revolution the way we lived, but also there's been a change, I think in more recent time, David, when I, my children are now in their twenties and thirties. And um, I came through a period where my mother uh, believed in, in wrapping. She believed in sleeping babies on their sides. And I did that, but I also slept my babies on their tummies because I, I have a background as a nurse and in neonatal units in those days, all our babies slept on their tummies. So I had a belief that that was safe. And so it's really important to know that um, this is what David does so well, is the research to check that what we are doing is, is the safest. So on one hand, we have to ensure that our, our mamas, our queers, our aunties actually do have the best type of advice available to them. And they'll do that from their own experience and their practice. But it's important that they are also highly aware of and we know today that sleeping on your back is the safest. So the research that David, Professor Ed, um, Stephanie Cowan have all done has shown that our babies need to be on their backs now. And there's a, a range of reasons for that, mostly around um, uh, safety with, with keeping our airways open and that vulnerable period, which we know is 
sort of two to four months is the most vulnerable period of that. So we, part of our role has been to make sure that we continue that messaging and we've kept with the PPE message. So place baby in their, uh, in their own uh, sleeping space that can be slept with beside or between mum and dad. Um, eliminate smoking and that's a huge one and that's probably the biggest one that we're focused on now, isn't it David? That we've, the other messages are fairly clear but the smoking, as, as David's spoken about, poorer communities in Māori, I'm sure all of you know our, our stats for Māori and particularly Māori women who are hapu are still far above what we would consider important. Um, position baby, so position them on their back, back and in our wahakura teaching our mums to get the feet down the, to the foot of the bed so that baby doesn't slide under any of the blankets and then encourage and support breastfeeding, immunisation, um, gentle handling. It's a little bit of a, a growing one, that one, to cover off all the things that we want um, our mums to know. So we stick with the PP message. We're aware that Stephanie has a really clear um, education package that goes with hers, with, with PP pods, but we know, as David's already spoken about, that Te Porter is such an excellent space for our woman for our whānau, for our nans and aunties to come in and have the discussion. So it's much less about where the experts are telling you what to do, and it's more about having conversations that allow mums to learn as they're weaving or as they're, they're watching um, more about those messages and, and opportunity to explain the whys of that. Because if you're anything like me, just telling me that I can't drive at, a, that I have to drive at 100 k's on the road will not necessarily make me do it. But the evidence in the, um, yeah, the, what comes out of it is what generally convinces us that we should make a change. I just think that there's something worth adding here. I think that the, the, the take home message, if you like, I mean, there's lots of take home messages about safety and stuff, um, which, are, which are great. But the big message is that there's not enough of this stuff out there. And so I'm just re recalling, as Faye is saying, Te Whare Pora, well, actually, we've got one. <laughs> yeah. you know, and and uh, it's got three years worth of funding. And so what, yes, what we're trying to do is to put the research around it and the evaluation around it so that it is found to do the things that we say it's going to do. So that therefore we get more funding and we're able to roll this thing out. The, the, the problem is that we're always on the back foot. I mean, the Wahakura is still on the back foot. We still don't have enough. There is, it's still, it's not an economic pr proposition um, in New Zealand to make things safe for infants in deprived communities. It's just not normal. The normal is for, the accepted normal are things that happen for infants in yeah. middle class communities. Um, and so to do things slightly differently and to put funding into things that only really serve one part of the population is just in this country too hard to do because the truth being that in fact we are extraordinarily racist in this country we just don't talk about it and we don't understand ourselves as being like that you know we are in in the levels of racism we're probably one of the best countries in the world but in levels of actually we won't do that because maori babies are going to only get to be the ones who um who really, put, who really benefit from that, so uh, we'll leave that one alone, we won't do it. So wahakuras, we've been trying to put up the wahakura as the appropriate thing for New Zealand babies. Yes, for Māori babies, yes, for at-risk babies, but if we can put the message out there, because it's true that Pākehā mums want wahakura. Um, and if what we do, and look, Jacinda Ardern is a wahakura mum. Her number one political advisor is a wahakura mum. These women, the best thing that could happen to the wahakura is if our prime minister um, got on national television and said, I'm a wahakura mum, here it is, and look, here's me. She's still um, dragging her wahakura behind her. So, you know, it's kind of like if we can market it as a normal part of New Zealand behaviour, then maybe what we can do is we can get these things um, provided for in communities that actually really, really need them. David, it's not just to Whare Porter though that we get our, I mean, while I totally agree with you, um, all across the country now, Wānanga Wahakura are, are occurring, 
and um, if we can increase those, and, and I think you're talking about value, is that people don't often realise that kairaranga are actually specialists in their field. As much as you have a medical degree, we should be giving them a degree in, in, um, in raranga mahi. And when we value that, um, those women, and they just put such a tremendous amount of effort into their, into their um, both their teaching and into their weaving. And I think that's, you know, I want to acknowledge all the DHBs across the country, all the communities that are having these wānanga and sometimes producing 10 or a dozen over a weekend um, for our pēpi. And, and we want to increase that, that we see that as part of our role. You're going to want to go to questions, Nadi, because I see there's some on the chat and I bet there's a whole lot. Yeah. So there's quite a few in the chat, and I think anyway, you've you've pretty much covered all the questions that I've um, I've was intending to ask of you. Uh, just probably a, just a couple of things from both of you is where to next for Wahakura? I know you've, but just wrap it up into a couple of sentences if you can. What is your where to next for Wahakura, David? Um, Fare pora. Fare pora. Wharepura is the where to next, because the Wharepura is the one that does the wahakura, um, and then, because uh, we've invented this kind of wahakura-based um, smoking cessation program that has got little karakias in it, and you know, something that mums can identify with, um, and we've also got the services, so the Wharepura is the next place, um, and the whole idea of this, what I was talking about before, that Wahakura actually became something that Kiwi mums do. And if we can make it that Kiwi mums do, um, then what happens is that it instantly becomes available for those Māori mums, Māori mums, and increasingly Pacific mums who need this intervention um, to make sure their babies survive. And to me, it's a greater investment in Wahakura and a lesser investment in, in pepe pods so that we, we see that balance change and it's available for more. Kia ora. So I've, got, I've actually got a number of questions. Uh, I'm just going to pick a couple because we're going to run out of time very soon. And thank you to all of those who have joined the webinar. Uh, we have got a number of questions. So what we can't cover today, we will definitely um, get back to you through... Um, through the Facebook or we will find some way of returning your answers. Uh, we do have a National Suti Prevention Coordination website so we might actually uh, put it up in the chats in there as well. So uh, thank you for those. So Janine Young has, has thank you for joining us from Australia uh, and she's got a number of questions. One of them is Perhaps a project could be to test if the smell of the wahakura may have may help a distressed child settle at various stages of development if they had exposure as a baby. That's not the question. The question is, was the wahakura based on the traditional pōrakaraka? I read that in one of David's papers. How is the pōrakaraka different to a wahakura? Okay, well, so everybody who's listening, um, Janine's incredibly clever. Um, that was a great question, you know, the, the, about smelling a wahakura, is that good for distress? What a wonderful research question. Come on, Janine, let's do that piece of work. Um, is it based on a pōrakaraka? Well, the truth is that we don't know, because um, the pōrakaraka, um, what we tried to do was we tried to base it on tikanga Māori, so we said, hey, it's made out of flax, and hey, it's made by traditional um, Māori craftspeople, artisans, um, so this is traditional, and yes, we found the pōrakaraka written up in one um, ethnologist book, who he wrote it, I think, in 1907, but, and he described it as a, um, a, a cradle-like baby container that was slung by a rope from the rafters of the house. So we don't know that it was made out of flax, but what else could it have been made out of? And we don't know what shape it was, but hello, it was probably some sort of bag, you know, um, very much in the, the way that people are inventing slings these days and those sorts of things. So it was a, it was a carrying bag. We, we don't really know what it was based on, but, but the idea is, um, and this is possibly 
what Janine might possibly be thinking of over there is basing it on something traditional that women of particular communities, in this case, indigenous communities, just will identify with. And so is there a way that you can create um, something that's a bit like a coolerman? So a coolerman is a wooden baby container um, that is made by men for their infant babies um, in Aboriginal Australia. Um, they are carrying objects, they are sleeping places, um, and they are little sort of curved things like this about, about so long, and the baby sleeps in it. And so, you know, if, if there was some way that you could base a, um, something for the Aboriginal community on something that they know or identify with or can reclaim, then that's what it's all about. Kia ora. And Faye, I'll give you this one. So this is from Grace Maha at Taranaki DHB. Kia ora, Grace. Uh, aside from the MOH specifications for Wahakura, which aren't specifications, they're guidelines, are there any other compliance or testing processes that Kairaranga must meet for their mahi to be accepted? No, well, we don't certainly don't have any in the, the document that you um, have spoken about was written actually very much in, um, with David's view to it. So no, that, that's all that's required. I don't know of any others, do you, David? No. I mean, I, I'm, I, I have to admit to not knowing the, exactly what it says and all the, the, the rules, but the only thing that ever worried me and about Wahakura's was how stiff the walls were. Um, and it's very practical, you know, because you want, you want there are particular types of flax that are quite um, soft um, and the walls will simply collapse inward. Um, that I'm not sure that that makes them any less safe um, because there's still a space that is not going to get encroached by parents. But if the walls are sticking up like this, they just seem so much more useful and safe. Mm. And just a reminder, our, our guidelines for Wahakura uh, are exactly what David just said. It's about making sure that there's, there's some stiff walls and that they're at a certain height with the mattress being flat. Uh, yes. Yep, there you go. Right. Yeah. And I think we'll just manage one more question. Uh, so this is from Emily Timmermans. For safety, until what age, David, would you recommend that baby sleeps with parents? Um, that ba you mean in a wahakura? So if, the, if this question is about the wahakura, probably you know, what we, we know is that the, the, the theoretically the post neonatal period for one month to one year is, the, is where we have difficulty. But as soon as, they, as, soon as the world solved the um, sleeping prone position and babies were turned over, it shrank down to sort of one month, maybe three weeks uh, to four or five months. So that was a high risk period. Um, the very high risk period is in that early up to two months period. So one of the problems is the size of your wahakura. So the answer to the question is as long as possible. Um, because they continue to be just a great sleeping space. So I've got a lot of um, mums who once they've had their baby in the wahakura and, and the baby is sort of, you know, sticking out the end, they go off and they just get a big, huge wahakura made. Um, so as long as possible, but the big risk period is up to sort of five months. Per, five months. Kia Sure. So that's the end of our webinar. Thank you, uh, Faye and David. It's been great, and I'm sure everyone's enjoyed the call at all. So uh, that's a wrap, and I think I will just close us with a karakia. Bye.